thank you very much to uh, the French Institute for inviting me to uh, give this talk. I'm particularly pleased um, to see so many people um, to come and uh, hear about Jean-Paul Belmondo and also to watch the wonderful film that we're about to see, um, Léon Morin Prêtre. I'm also particularly pleased because I haven't actually given a talk face to face in a year and a half. I've done stuff online like all my colleagues and um, so it's particularly pleasing to actually be talking to real people. Um, so um, my title, um, as Diane mentioned, refers to a familiar division in, Be in Belmondo's identity as a star. That is to say the split between his work in auteur cinema and especially the new wave in the early 1960s and his hugely successful career in popular cinema uh, for several decades. Uh, and as um, what we can observe is that um, the, the first part, the, the new wave cinema, has exported very well, is known internationally. His popular career um, in the 70s and 80s uh, is much, well, uh, much less well known outside France. So in this uh, introduction, I will explore briefly the highlights of Belmondo's career given that he made 91 films as an actor, not to talk about his career in the theater and also as a producer. So for the sake of argument, I think of him then as the face of the new wave and the body of popular cinema, as illustrated by the two pictures on my slide. But of course, as we will see, it's more complicated than that. And I will end my talk with a few remarks about the film that we will watch tonight, um, Léon Morin Prêtre starring, of course, Jean-Paul Belmondo. Now, as many of you know, Belmondo was born in 1933 in an artistic family. His father was a famous sculptor, and he grew up with two passions, sports, uh, boxing, football, uh, and the theater. He graduated with a prize in comedy from the Conservatoire de Paris in 1956, and the fact that his comedy is very relevant, of course, to his subsequent career. His early career was complicated with two bouts as a conscript in the army, including in Algeria. He naturally started in the theater, given his training, where he met with some success and did small parts as well in a few mainstream films, such as the one you see on my slide, Un drôle de dimanche, Sois belle et tais-toi, and Les tricheurs, where his name does not even appear on the poster. Now, of course, if you buy a DVD of them now, you will see his name prominently displayed, because in, in the intervening years, he has sort of eclipsed a number of his co-stars at the time. But a key encounter then, so in the second half of the 50s, was with Jean-Luc Godard, who said that he was impressed with Belmondo's physicality and cast him in the lead role in his short film, Charlotte et son Jules, in 1958. This led, in turn, to a lead role in Chabrol's film, A Double Tour, which is, in fact, technically Belmondo's first new wave film, although it didn't come out later and it sort of tends to be forgotten to some extent. The turning point, of course, for um, Belmondo and, uh, was Godard deciding to cast him as the lead in his first feature, A Bout de Souffle. A Bout de Souffle came out in March 1960 and made both its director and uh, star celebrities. Even myth in Belmondo's words, leading to what he himself calls Belmondo, Belmondisme, Belmondoism. Um, from then on, he moved away from the theater and became a full-time film star for several decades. Godard's film came out a year after Chabrol, Truffaut, and René had made the, the first new wave films, uh, Le Beau Serge, Les Quatre Cents Coups, Hiroshima Mon Amour. And yet, as you can see from those images, Abu de Souf is the film which that perhaps more than any other has come to signify the new wave. Of course, this has to do with Godard's innovative techniques and aesthetics, his freewheeling narrative and jagged editing, and also the presence of American star Gene Seberg. But I think it was also in large part due to Belmondo's charisma and presence in the film. So why did he become what I call the face of the new wave? 
Now, it's interesting, first of all, to speculate on Belmondo's association with the new wave, because in many ways, he was not the typical male actor of that movement, which, apart from privileging women, so Jeanne Moreau, Anna Karina, Emmanuel Riva, foregrounded a new brand of masculinity that was softer, more fragile, sometimes duplicating the personality of the filmmaker himself. So Trintignant, Jean-Louis Trintignant, Jean-Pierre Léo, Gérard Blain, or kind of dandy figures like Jean-Claude Brialy. And these actors tended to portray more artistic or intellectual figures, so a long way from Belmondo. Um, now, Belmondo, by contrast, was more physical and less conventionally pretty. Uh, his face was more angular and with a famous squashed nose. He was often at the time, in, at, at his, the beginning of his career, described as ugly. Um, but Abu de Souffle displays uh, the qualities which means that he could overcome this so-called ugliness. Uh, we see in the film his erotic appeal and his athletic demeanor. Now you've just seen a little um, trailer which gave, give you a sense in case you haven't seen the film. Um, and he's in Abu Souf, he's constantly on the move, on the prowl. He gets into women's bedrooms, he jumps into cars and, and walks up and down the Champs Elysees. But the film also foregrounds his face, I think, in interesting ways. So here you can see on the left-hand side, at the bottom, Godard, who himself appears in a cameo in the film, and how he models himself on the star above him, or the other way around. And secondly, um, the film also closely associates Belmondo's face with that of Humphrey Bogart in a very famous scene in the film, thus embedding him in a history of cinema and a prestigious line of male stars. Indeed, on one of the many box sets of his films that you can buy, Belmondo is referred to as France's answer to Humphrey Bogart. And of course, there is the radical modernity of the character sustained by his charismatic performance, his nonchalant and insolent attitude, which perfectly matched Godard's attitude to conventional filmmaking. We're going to see a very small clip, which in fact you've just seen in the trailer to the season, I didn't realize that, uh, in one moment in the film, um, in, in, in one of the famous moments in the film. Now, French speakers may listen to Belmondo's accent, which deliberately incorporates a sort of popular Parisian tone, what you call in French la gouaille. Um, but even if you don't speak French, I think you pick up the tone, the humor, the kind of blasé, insolent, and even in this case, insulting tone, uh, whereas Godard insults the spectator directly to camera. Um, and, and also, even if you don't pick up the tone of his voice, this is, I think, visually echoed in the swaggering way in which he holds his cigarette in his mouth. Si vous n'aimez pas la mer, si vous n'aimez pas la montagne, si vous n'aimez pas la ville, allez vous faire foutre. Now, Abou Souf transformed Belmondo's career dramatically. He became overnight hugely in demand, and by 1963, he'd already made 25 films, as in the eloquent title of his autobiography called 30 ans et 25 films, so 30 years old and 25 films. Throughout the 1960s, the split signaled by my title between new wave and popular, and popular cinema began to be felt, but in that decade, he managed to keep both tracks going at the same time, successfully mixing films by Godard, Chabrol, Truffaut, and René, so on the left-hand side of my slide, um, uh, with popular films, and on the, on the right-hand side. Um, now, this is obviously a tiny sample, but I want to pick up two main directions into those films go, and which will be influential for the rest of his career. So first, comic adventures in fantastic landscapes, typified by L'Homme de Rio, um, made in 1964 in a contemporary environment, uh, and the swashbuckler cartouche set in the past. And these are genres that emphasize Belmondo's athletic physique and attractiveness to women who are always played by very glamorous female stars. 
And the second type of film that he begins to make, um, with like Un Singe en Hiver, with Jean Gabin, one of his acknowledged models, and Cent Mille Dollars au Soleil, with Lino Ventura, both directed by Henri Verneuil, celebrate a type of masculinity that some of us might call toxic nowadays, but which was very much in demand. In these films, women are marginal or get in the way, and the films display a strong macho and even sometimes misogynist streak, either in a kind of bitter pessimistic mode, as in Un singe en hiver, where um, the two characters get drunk and sort of ramble on about women um, and, and what a pain they are, or virile adventure mode, as in Cent Mille Dollars au Soleil. And I think that Belmondo's ability to convincingly act in both the films of the, new, of the directors of the new wave and the giants of French mainstream cinema led to his success. Now, this was, of course, criticized in some quarters as wasting his talent. So the cinephile press immediately turned against those popular films by Belmondo, with Belmondo. But it was, I think, actually proof of his, first of all, his versatility as an actor, the legacy of his training, compared to, say, actors like Jean-Pierre Léo, who could only be in New Wave films. Uh, but also, um, it was possible because of the unstructured nature of the French film industry. While he formed partnerships with some directors, like Verneuil and Godard, uh, there was no Hollywood-style studio to format his image uh, or impose particular genres or behaviors to him. So we can see that he takes advantage of that sort of freedom that the structure of the industry gives him. Now, by the time we move to the 70s and 80s, this tendency towards genre cinema becomes more acute. Belmondo becomes Bebel, at the center of numerous box office hits. The film that marks the transition is Borsalino, on the left-hand side, 1969, in which he features alongside his rival, Alain Delon, in ways that usefully emphasize their differences. So where Delon plays a very cool gangster with minimalist acting, Belmondo fools around all the time and smiles a lot. So hence, my chapter, One Smiles, the Other Doesn't. From now on, the core elements of Belmondo's image, his physicality, his humor, sex appeal, feature in a series of star vehicles, gangster films, policiers, parodies of spy films, where he is forever muscular, tanned, and sexy, um, but where the physicality begins to tip sometimes into violence, uh, and the cigarette of Abu Tsouf becomes a large cigar. The films also belong to what is called the comedian comedy style, Jean, if you like, as they are entirely focused on him, his performance, his body, his character, and as illustrated by the title, so you see Le Solitaire, Le Magnifique, Le Professionnel, Le Marginal, on and on. And I want to illustrate two main strands in, his, uh, in this, the erotic appeal and the physical exploits, and we're going to see a couple of small clips. So first we're going to see a short clip from Le Magnifique, 1973, a parody of a spy film which shows eloquently how Belmondo's body is eroticized while remaining virile and energetic. Now, note the uh, military uh, pendants, I think um, they called dog something, I've forgotten the name, uh, that, that soldiers had to wear, uh, which kind of connotes this kind of virility. Um, and note also the exotic settings. Now, there are no subtitles in this, and, but there's very little dialogue, so if you're not a French speaker, it doesn't, it's not difficult. At the end, Jacqueline Bisset, his partner, says, women like you, and he replies, I don't know, and she says, liar. So that's the, the extent of the dialogue. And I, but in any case, I think you'll appreciate the parodic tone and the ubiquitous smile. <laughs> Thank you. 
pensez aux femmes Je ne sais pas. <rire> Menteur. OK, you got that. Um, so, physical, physical exploits, Belmondo's other signature, apart from this erotic appeal, are present from the start as well. But in the 1970s and 80s, they structure entire sequences in the film made of stunts, as in Peur sur la Ville. Increasingly, the physicality is the spectacle of the film, with a layer of authenticity interestingly brought by the fact that most of the stunts are noticeably performed by the star himself and always advertised as such. Now, I want to show you a clip from Le Professionnel, 1981, one of the films shown here as part of this retrospective, which neatly, I think, combine Bebel, the ladies' man, with Bebel, the tough guy. The woman in the clip, just to, so you know what, what's happening, is a prostitute whose client has just been knocked out by Bebel uh, and who is himself uh, wanted by the police. But there are subtitles um, here. Il m'a demandé de vous retenir et de lui téléphoner. Ça vous amuse Non, j'étais en train de penser que je ne détesterais pas vous retenir, mais sans lui téléphoner. Mais oui, oui, il est seul, se fout. Il me dit, il me dit les espions, les, 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 chat, les châtaignes. Les affaires reprennent. Je ne dirai rien. Je n'ameuterai pas l'hôtel, je ne poserai pas de questions, mais dors Mais d'abord, qu'est-ce que vous faites là, vous C'est moi le responsable. Je m'en vais. Pierrot a rejoint Colombie. Arlequin est disparu sur la pointe des pieds. Tu vas pas sortir comme ça, il y a deux flics dehors. Tes cinglés, ils vont te tomber dessus. Aucune importance. J'ai ce qu'ils appellent l'avantage de la surprise. reflect now briefly <clears throat> on what we've seen and on, on this uh, phase of Belmondo's career in, in popular genre films, such as those little extra give you a sense of. With the run of box office successes, and as suggested by the affectionate nickname Bebel, Belmondo enjoyed a tremendous level of popularity in France, which can be seen as deeply connected to national identity. Belmondo not only refused to go to Hollywood, but he acclimatized international screen heroes, such as James Bond, into the French context, inhabiting the same luxury spaces, yet remaining stubbornly French. The extra layer of humor linked him further to his French audience, who enjoyed the comic dialogues by the likes of Michel Audiard and the star's good humor tone and jokes and, and jokey turns of, uh, of voice, as you, you've just heard when he put on an accent uh, to make his last joke about the couscous poulet. Poulet being a slang word for, for, for a cop. Belmondo's mainstream films did not export well to Anglophone countries, but they did well elsewhere. The Russian writer Andrei Makin, reflecting on Le Magnifique, so the other clip you saw, ascribed the star's success to the apparent inv invulnerability of his characters and their fairy tale ubiquity. I quote, he came, multiple like some Hindu divinity, now driving a huge white car into the sea, now thrashing in a swimming pool under the, the lascivious gaze of bathing beauties. He knocked his opponents out in a thousand ways, wrestled in the traps they laid for him, saved his companions. End of quote. Now, there have been less idyllic views of Belmondo's image. The national anchorage of his popular films often borders on the nationalistic, and the racist. You saw the joke about couscous poulet at the end of the clip from Le Professionnel, but I have spared you other and often cruder racist jokes in his films and other, and other films. Similarly, the, ca the casual flirting that you saw in Le Magnifique at times veers into gross sexism. In Le Magnifique, 
later on in the film, Belmondo plays, Belmondo plays a writer who imagines wildly exciting adventures and situations, such as what you saw. But later in the film, sorry, it involves a Jacqueline Bisset character being gang raped and asking for more. Of course, Belmondo was not solely responsible for these films, but his celebrity and charisma normalized such situations, and his humor passed them off as jokes, helped by the fact that the scabrous sexual situations are never shown, uh, but implied by a few images of dialogue. Uh, they, these are films that are, on the whole, aimed at a family audience. Nevertheless, it is, in, in, it is difficult not to interpret the success of Belmondo's roles in such films as a form of backlash against the rise of feminism and women's greater equality in those deca decades. And with hindsight, we can see his image moving from modernity to reaction, or um, we could say more positively, to a form of resistance, a resistance to American cinema and to the intellectual cinema that the success of the new wave had helped come into being. Stars like Belmondo and Delon did much to sustain the viability of French cinema through these decades of declining national um, box office, um, declining um, success for French cinema as opposed to American cinema. So they, they, we can see him as also embodying this kind of resistance to uh, the decline of French cinema. Now, very quickly, let me say something about his later career, um, and then I'll come to uh, Léon morin -Prêtre. While Belmondo remained a popular figure, inevitably the tough guy and adventure films began to wane, and, while, uh, and also he was aging. And while he carried on working until 2008, his career was more or less ended by a stroke he suffered in 2001. So, just what I want to point out in his later film, and again, this is a very small sample of quite, quite, a, quite a long filmography. First of all, father-daughter stories, um, that, such as um, the two films on, on the left, uh, that place him in a long line of mature male French actors, such as Jean Gabin, Fernandel, or Yves Montand, who swap in their old age romantic couples for quasi-incestuous pairings with very young women, such as Sophie Marceau and Vanessa Paradis in this case. Second trend uh, are remakes, which also in a way interestingly recall past glories of French cinema, such as Rému in the first version of L'Inconnu dans la Maison, uh, or Charles Vanel in L'Aîné des Fers Chauds. And here it's interesting because um, Belmondo himself had played the young man in, the, in an earlier version of the film. Um, also, I think in playing Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, similarly, Belmondo reprised the role, which is, um, has be, was, is almost canonical for aging, mature French male actors. And Jean Valjean has been incarnated by Harry Bor, Jean Gabin, Lino Ventura, Gérard Depardieu, and so on. So it, it's absolutely fitting that Belmondo would end up playing uh, that, that role in the Claude Lelouch film. And, and finally, in that period, he went back to the theater uh, as, uh, as an actor, but also as producer and uh, as owner. He owned the Théâtre des Variétés. Um, and I remember uh, going to see him in La Puce à l'Oreille, um, where he was very funny. And um, if you are interested, I noticed this weekend that uh, the, the television version of La Puce à l'Oreille is on YouTube. So you can watch it if you like. Um, so now, let me go back in time to 1961 and Léon morin prêtre Just say a few words of introduction um, before I let you enjoy it. So this was uh, Léon morin prêtre interestingly, was Jean-Pierre Melville's, uh, the director, it was his bid to make popular films um, after several critically acclaimed films that he had made that, but that failed at the box office, like Bob Le Flambeur. And the strategy worked, and I think it worked to a large extent thanks to Belmondo. The film was a box office success with uh, almost two million spectators in France alone, and it was also highly regarded critically. Uh, and Melville, in fact, would reuse Belmondo in two uh, other films, which I recommend, if you don't know them, as all three of them, I think, of a very interesting set of films exploring what you might call ambivalent masculinity in three different genres. So the wartime drama of Léon Morin-Prêtre, 
a film noir, Le Doulos, and a male melodrama with Lenny de Fershaw, which, as I said, he also remade later on. Uh, but the first version is much, much more interesting. Um, so, Léon Morin Prêtre was directed by Jean Pierre Melville then in 1961, and it was based on an autobiographical novel by Beatrix Beck, um, and a novel that was awarded the Prix Goncourt in 1952. And the book and the film are about a platonic relationship between a Catholic priest and a communist woman during the Second World War against the background of an occupied small town in the Alps, in, in France. And despite this rather austere subject then, the film, like the book, as I said, was a huge success. So um, we might then ponder why this was the case, and I would offer three reasons. First of all, I think that this double topic of forgiven, forbidden love, sorry, between a woman and a Catholic priest, um, uh, and which is in itself part of an international subgenre, and I've listed a few titles on my slide, um, and uh, is on the one hand, and the still traumatic German occupation of France, um, on the other hand, uh, I think are very important to explain why the film did so well in 1961. Uh, Melville praised uh, Beatrix Beck's book as, I quote, the most accurate picture I have read of the life of the French people under the occupation, end of quote. Now, his adaptation, and partly for reasons of length, reduced the historical background that is in the novel. And I recommend the novel, by the way, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and, and the film was cut from a much, much longer, uh, it was a, almost over three hours version, and now what you're going to see is under two hours. Um, surprisingly, given that uh, Melville himself was, was Jewish, he reduced the Jewish strand of the story, although it reappears, you will see, in, in a number of small ways. Nevertheless, Léon Morin is, for its time, a rare document about this traumatic period of French history. Now, the second reason to explain why the, why the film was so successful is, of course, the cast. Uh, so Belmondo and Emmanuel Riva together bring the image of youthful innovation of the new wave. Um, she had been in uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, as we know Belmondo in um, Abu de Souffle. And, and through them, I think Melville very cleverly makes a potentially slightly old-fashioned and austere subject into an exciting, sexy one. Uh, and thirdly, of course, is Melville's brilliant mise en scène, which combines new wave features, as you will see, such as location shooting, with classical studio filmmaking. And I want to, to finish now. I don't want to, I didn't want to spoil the film. For, for you, for the, especially those who have not seen it before. So I won't say much more about it. I just want to point to um, the camera work, uh, which the film was um, uh, photographed by Henri Dequet, a great director of photography, and which I think the camera work is, is worth looking out for. It's very fluid in a discreet way, which I, what I call Melville's quiet virtuoso style. Um, and, um, but as we are here for Belmondo, um, I'm, I'm not going to say more about that, but I'm, I think I would suggest you look in particular how, at how he is used in the film. Uh, and I would mention two things. First, the way the film works uh, both with Belmondo's features and performance style, so his, his energy, his athletic demeanor, his, his sex appeal, but also against it, because of course, um, it's, a very, it's very much a piece of, of unexpected casting to have Jean-Paul Belmondo as a, and when you read the reviews of the film at the time, it's all about, oh my God, Bel Belmondo as a priest, this is extraordinary. So it's, I think Melville uh, is very cleverly does both, so it's very interesting. And secondly, I think the lighting, the way the lighting is used in the film is, is also extremely complex and interesting. Um, and especially, I think, over the character of Léon Morin, which I've, I've just picked up four images from the film here, um, that often show him as an, as an opaque, darkly mysterious character um, through uh, this very dramatic expressionist lighting. So like here you're almost in a film noir, but not with the rest of the film. So I think it's interesting to look at that. And I'm going to stop now so that we can enjoy the film. I really do think that it's one of the most interesting uh, films of, in Belmondo's um, filmography because it aptly brings together um, his image as both the face of the new wave and the body of popular cinema. And thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 